I'm Luke Cascarini. I'm a TMJ surgeon. I'm going to describe to you a case of a young patient who had internal derangement of their temporal mandibular joint as a result of chronic overload. In their case, it was a bruxism uh, in combination with a bit of hypermobility that led to this problem. The initial assessment involved finding the cause of the problem, managing that cause first, which in this case meant splint therapy, which inhibited the bruxism, reduced the load on the joint, and the patient found that their headaches got better, the muscle pain got better, but uh, they still had an annoying, painful click in the left temporal mandibular joint. The MRI demonstrated internal drain. This is a non-contrast MRI scan of the patient's left temporomandibular joint in open and closed. And you can um, see it's a dynamic scan, so I can scroll and move the condyle. This is a T2 type scan where uh, the uh, wet, the watery parts show up bright here, which is the hinging part of the lower jaw. The base of the skull here, which is the hinging part of the lower jaw, which is the part that moves. Above it is the brain, and in between is a small piece of bone. And this black area you can see here is the disc. And with the jaw closed, the disc is slightly anteriorly displaced. And on opening, you can see how the disc drops back to fill the gap between the condyle and the top of the joint. And in this case, the patient's slightly hypermobile and the condyle can actually move very far through the joint and uh, to condition called subluxation. But the disc here, you can see, has reduced and gone back to its correct position. So this is internal derangement, that is the disc is not where it should be, but with reduction because it reduces back to the normal position. And this creates a clicking noise. And in this patient's situation, it's a painful, annoying click, and uh, they wanted to have it treated. So this is a cone beam CT scan. And I do these scans to demonstrate the bony anatomy in more detail. One of the important things to look for is the thickness of this piece of bone in the top of the socket. Uh, this is called the roof of the fossa. This bone can be very thin, as you can see here, and we just need to be aware of that and make sure there isn't actually a defect in that bone because this is the brain on the other side of it. The other thing we're looking for is that there's adequate joint space because over a prolonged period of time with displaced disc, you can sometimes get collapse of that joint space and then there's just not room to be able to bring the disc back and fix it. But this case demonstrates uh, um, preservation of joint space and a reasonably healthy joint other than the displaced disc. So this is the view on initial entry into the left temporomandibular joint. Uh, at this stage there's just the outflow needle and uh, obviously the scope. The scope is at the very posterior part of the joint so we're looking forward. This arrow here demonstrates how we're looking forward. So this is the anterior recess, this is the medial compartment. And we're looking to see if there are adhesions, to see where the disc is displaced, and if there are perforations, and to assess the, uh, uh, the general state of the joint. And in this case, you can see the disc is antero medially displaced, and this is the uh, appearance of the blood vessels in the synovium, which have crept up. So at this stage, two minutes, 50 seconds, uh, you can see the edge of the second port, which is just in front of the scope port. And I put a straight instrument through that port under direct vision into this area here, which is the retrodiscal region. I pick up this fibrous band at the back and use that by pressing down and backwards to reduce the disc. And you can see the disc nicely unrolling as it's being pulled back and outwards. And it's held in that position by my assistant. We're now uh, almost seven minutes into the surgery and you can see uh, this is spinal needle coming through into the reduced disc. Uh, this needle is inserted just in front of the earlobe, through the skin, through the capsule and up into this space. You need to bear in mind that's uh, about three, 
uh, millimetres by about three millimetres area that I'm aiming for. And that spinal needle will uh, come through the disc and then I'll put a thread through that needle and then retrieve it in the, in the next stage. Okay, so this is the next stage. You can see the needle here and just passing a thread. That's uh, a resorbal suture pass that through down the spinal needle from the outside. And then the third port uh, is used, uh, which is just below and just in front of the scope. Uh, that instrument is 1.8 millimeters approximately in diameter. So you can see it's very magnified, it's a very small instrument. This is the stage of surgery where I'm going to retrieve the suture, which you can see has been passed through the needle. The needle is slightly withdrawn. The suture is passed through. Uh, these are the graspers just coming through the port here. Uh, this instrument is under two millimeters in diameter, so it's very magnified. You can see how the graspers come through. And I grasp that suture and then withdraw it back through the port and then that suture now runs through the skin, through the capsule, through the disc and back out close uh, to where it went in. This is the final stage where um, I can hold the suture from outside and I'm demonstrating that I can pull the disc backwards and outwards using the suture. This surgical procedure takes anything between 5 and 15 minutes for that procedure itself. The whole setup and the turnaround time in theatre is quite a lot longer because of the complexity of the equipment etc. It requires a nasal intubation which takes a bit of time as well but um, the patient will wake up and go to recovery where I'll see them there. The most important thing after this surgery is to not to try to open the jaw at all initially and a uh, patient will be discharged later the same day on a limited range of movement which means they avoid opening their jaw anything other than really just a small hinging movement which means it's really liquid food for about three weeks when I'll see the patient and outpatients and then start the gradual increase in movement over the course of the next six to twelve weeks.